So Foster, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Mark. Wonderful to be here tonight. I, we will, of course, folks uh, listening, of course, we'll get to Barney Miller, but we're going to start with Hal Linden's really fabulous musical career. And when you hear all the people he worked with over the years and all the composers and choreographers and directors, you'll see why it's really an important historical uh, uh, account that we're going to get tonight of Amer American musical theater in its glory days. Hal, you really hit the musical theater at a time when it was its most vibrant, when many geniuses were, were producing extraordinary shows. And you started out with uh, Bells Are Ringing, directed by Jerome Robbins, co-choreographed by Jerome Robbins and uh, Bob Fosse, Judy Holliday starring. How lucky can you get? Uh, it was actually, uh, that was my Broadway debut. Seriously, my first step on the Broadway stage was in the leading role opposite Judy Holliday in Bells Are Ringing. I was, I was Sidney Chaplin's standby and I had just joined the show. Unfortunately, I, I didn't work with Jerry. I joined the show uh, midstream. It was already a, a major hit, but uh, the standby for Sydney had left to do another play or something. And uh, my girlfriend at the time was in the show and recommended me to the stage manager as the, a new uh, understudy. They were gonna go from standby to understudy. I was in summer stock. I had never been on Broadway. I came, I must have auditioned for the doorman. I auditioned for everybody just to get an audition for the auditioner. Yeah. because I, I didn't even have an agent and my last audition was between shows on a Saturday I had to audition for Judy and she had to okay me she okayed me on Saturday I started on Monday with a script and a stage manager on Saturday was my first understudy rehearsal and right in the middle of it, the stage manager came, stage manager came out and said, keep going, because you're on this afternoon. <laughs> and I made my Broadway debut in what, six days, or five days of rehearsal. What was uh, Judy Holiday like as a co-player? Um, memorable, probably the most generous, actor I ever worked with. Uh, this, I always tell this story. The, the song Just In Time was done in one and it was just uh, d dancing. I just took her in my arms and danced across the stage with her singing in her ear, Just In Time, I Found You, etc. And after about four bars i felt her i was just doing it i was just took her in my arms and sang in her ear after about four bars i felt her hand on my back twisting me so, so i was singing this way and it took me a couple of bars to realize that she, what she was doing was turning me out to the audience so that i would be so that it was my moment, not she, her back was to the audience, basically. Um, she did the whole show that way. She spent half that show with her back to the audience because it was really somebody else's scene. Uh, I have not found that generosity <laughs> as common in the rest of my career. You know, that, what, that quality you're talking about comes through in all of her work. You just feel it. It is right there. And you, there was a genuineness that came through in everything she did in films and stage. She was one of a kind and extraordinary. And the warmth and the, the humanity were overwhelming when you saw her. And my luck to have that as my first Broadway experience. Absolutely. Yes. And what our audience may not realize, I think I'm right about this, she won the Tony Award that year for Best Actress, and her competition was Julie Andrews for My Fair Lady. 
I really don't. I really don't know because I did. I wasn't in the show in the first year. But but, but isn't isn't that something? But her performance is extraordinary, and it's per her performance in the film, which isn't the equal of the show. But you still feel her the the, the warmth and the and the humor. She of her. was she was so warm. She got me a gig in the picture. Yes, I was going to mention that. How did she was responsible for you yeah. doing the Midas touch? Uh, of course she was. She's, <laughs> uh, well, I was staying in. I was were in California uh, for the. Uh, we had done it in, in the summer that summer, and I decided to stay in and see what I could do in California. And she, she said, no, we got to find your picture. You want to do Midas Touch? And they rewrote the Midas Touch for that. For that. Were you yeah. directed by Vincent Minnelli at all Vincent for Minnelli. that scene? You were. Not really. Not really. <laughs> well, it was, you know, it was, a, it was a nightclub singer. So the reality went out the window anyway. Um, but uh, no, he just, uh, I was more directed by a um, musical director. Oh my God, sorry. <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, spent more time with the musical director. Uh, the, the, but your number is very well staged because you're in the deep focus shot. And so it. your movements are continuous. My eye went to you because I was looking we at you. To, we had to do the whole number and there was yeah. a scene in front of it, exactly. Yes. Yes, well, we did, we did, I, you can, they were honest for the beginning and the end, I guess. Yeah. Now your next show, uh, perhaps the star wasn't quite as generous, but at least she was awfully unhappy. That was Wildcat with Lucille Ball. Excuse me, you jumped about four shows. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, got, you forgot to mention all my flops in between. <laughs> but that, but. But, th but isn't that an important show, Wildcat? Yes. Um, Why didn't it work, or, or did it work, but she didn't want to extend the run? So it has this reputation of not being a successful show. It wasn't, I don't think it was a successful show. I think that's one of the reasons she didn't want to continue. Uh, Lucy had in mind coming to Broadway and being, you know, hitting, hitting the jackpot with, whatever she did. And it could have run for as long as she wanted to do it. No question about it. People wanted to come and see her. It was not a bad show. It, it just didn't get the kind of prime response. She wanted the big notices and the, you know, and the, uh, everybody was kind of iffy about the show. They gave her nice notices, but it wasn't that big welcome to Broadway that she expected. And so she kind of um, crapped out at her, you know. Was she difficult? Difficult? Yes. Not really. Not really. No, Lucy was not difficult. Uh, if, you, if you played, um, um, what was the game she played all the time? With the, I'm getting old, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, she was a big uh, backgammon fan. She was a big backgammon player, and you had to play God, you had to play backgammon with her. And you would you would move a, a tile, and you and you'd look at Lucy, and she go, and you so you move it back, and then you try another touch. She go. <laughs> she was a brilliant backgammon player. But you know when she appeared on the talk shows, Jack Parr, and the talk shows of that era. I was always struck by the fact that she seemed to have no sense of humor whatsoever. I wouldn't say that either. Wouldn't say I, that either. I wouldn't say that either. Lucy was uh, when I met Lucy. Uh, by the way, I had met Lucy doing the uh, doing bells are ringing in um, in California. She had seen that show and we had a meeting and there were all kinds of plans made. And unfortunately, that's exactly when she broke up with Desi. So everything kind of went. I went back to New York into the theater and ended up <laughs> with her in Wildcat. So I knew Lucy very well by that time. Um, 
No, she had a sense of humor. She was just, she wasn't a stand-up is the point. Yeah. She was a comedic actress. She knew how to play a scene. Unfortunately, she didn't have the Broadway discipline, let me put it that way, or the stage discipline. So when things didn't go well with, with Wildcat, she started out living and the whole, uh, the whole feel of the whole play started to go downhill. And eventually she uh, collapsed on stage and that was the end of the run. Did she project to the audience? Did she have a oh, yeah. stage presentation technique? Oh, Oh yeah, oh yeah. She, that, but hey, she was very good in the show. Yeah, she was very good in the show. It's just that it wasn't a great show. It was a good score. Hey, you look me over. What was there? Some of the other tunes, you know. It was a Cy Coleman. Cy Coleman. Yeah, directed by Michael Kidd. She had the best. Michael Kidd. She had the best. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of shows that didn't work. Uh, but I want to hear about it because at you least... Want to hear all, that's my career, sir. <laughs> that's my career. That's not true. Not true at all. But the next show, at least the one I want. Oh, wait, excuse me. Excuse me. You did skip about four shows. You skipped uh, Subways Are For Sleeping, Something More. No, Something More is next up. Hell, that's what oh, I'm next? talking about okay. next. It's Maybe I got one. it back. And I don't know if this is true, but the director of record for something more is Julie Stein. Julie Stein. Did he, he actually act direct the show? He actually directed the show. He, uh, it wasn't until we were in Philadelphia that he turned it over to... Um... Sorry, again. Look it up. <laughs> uh, yes, Julie Stein directed it. It was very strange, I must tell you. <laughs> very strange one time why did he, do you know why he directed it you know once he did so many shows and i'm sure was unhappy with a lot of the staging of his numbers yeah. and and figured by that time he knew was he could do it you know and so he did it um <laughs> there was uh, I remember one piece of direction he gave to a to a, a, an actress who who had to leave by an upstage door. The door was on the back on the back wall, so she left upstage, and she had a line on the way out. And he said to her, "Don't say the line while you're walking. Walk while you say the line." <laughs> There was, so, was one I remember. Another one, uh, you know, when you put a new song in, you sing it for the uh, uh, orchestrator. So the, the orchestrator comes in and he, he, you do the song and, and so that he knows how to orchestrate it. And uh, he said to Arthur Hill, I think it was who had a new song. He said to him, sing it for me. And then walked out. <laughs> Julie was, Julie was, well, first of all, I think it was one of the greatest melody writers ever. Yeah. Nobody could write melodies and, 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 and like Julie Stein. He was just brilliant at that. He was not a very good director. I'll leave it at that. Then you were standby for On a Clear Day You Can See Forever. Yes. Did you go on? The did you depth, ever go on? The depth of my career. <laughs> yes, I did go on uh, in New York when we came back. Um, uh, an interesting, uh, well, as I say, the depth of my career because uh, Louis Jourdain, who was the original lead, was replaced in Boston by John Cullum, and I never got a shot at it. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't even have, I, I had to stay. I couldn't even afford to quit in, in a huff. So I, I, that's, 
I brought it back to New York. I actually did it in New York. It did not get terrific reviews. And by Christmas, as, as it was a, a usual thing in my career, by Christmas, I would get let go. You know, we'd open a show out of town, come into New York to bad reviews. And by Christmas, they had a cut back. <laughs> and so the first one to go was the standby. Uh, so it was not a... Uh, did, you, did you play, uh, have a chance to play opposite the great Barbara Harris? Yes, I did. I played opposite the great Barbara Harris in two shows. In that show, and then later on in uh, Apple Tree. She was extraordinary. She was, you know, there was an element of Judy Holiday there. Yes. Um, and in, I remember standing at the back of the theater in, uh, in Boston. She was singing, what did I have that I don't have? And it was staged, downstage right, her sitting in a chair, singing the whole song, which was a song about the end of her relationship, basically. What did I have that I don't have? Had to refer <clears throat> to the fact that the leading man had fallen in love with her prior existence yeah. and not with her. And it was almost the spitting image of Judy sitting downstage right in a chair, lamenting the end of her relationship with the parties over. And I just looked at them as the reincarnation of Judy Holiday. There was uh, uh, that wild imaginative quality in the two of them. And a great vulnerability. Yes, and exactly. So they're very touching, the both of them, extraordinary, the formers. Yeah. Uh, I saw you in this show I'm not sure it worked, but it was sort of fascinating. Ilya Darling, opposite Melina McQuarrie, directed by Jules Dassin. The French like to say Jules Dassin. He was Jules Dassin, Jules Dassin from Brooklyn. From Brooklyn, Jules Dassin from Paris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Now, uh, he was not a really musical director, I don't think. No, and he recognized it. <clears throat> Believe it or not, I mean, he would... Uh, he, he knew that he was in a, a, a medium that he was not comfortable with. And he called upon everybody around him to, to help out, even me. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, he, he it, I, I forget what it was, but I remember he pointed at me and said something, see, do it the way Hal does it or something like that. You know, uh, I was a little shaken by that, but he, he, he was open. He, he was trying to restage his movie. It was a yes. bit yes. of a lost cause. But let me tell you this. Um, a lot of people, you know, recognize me from Barney or the Rothschilds or even Bells Are Ringing. But it really, it really touches me when somebody remembers me in something as short-lived as <laughs> Ilya Darling. Yeah, totally. yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate I, I, it. I, I, I enjoyed the show. Melina McQuarrie, speaking of one of a kind, she had an extraordinary presence on stage. There was something electric about her on stage. There was no question. What was she like to work with? Very open and very aware also that she did not have, uh, you know, theater chops. Uh, so she was open to help from everybody. No, it was a, it was a very Greek cast, you know. Yes. <laughs> I was one of the un-Greeks. Uh, so there was a, a lot of kind of camaraderie. Although, if you remember, that was exactly the time when the colonels took over in Greece. Remember that? Oh, yes. And there was, when we, after we opened on Broadway, uh, there was a tremendous split in the cast and all the Greeks, because some went for the, uh, colonels and some went for the for the leftists and uh, I remember Melina used to make a curtain speech about it uh, and not everybody stayed on stage with her. Oh really? Yes. 
Uh, so there was a real uh, schism in the in the cast. This was just before it closed. It, it didn't yeah. last that long. She was very political, after all. Yes, after very that, political. went back and became a politician in yes. Greece. Yes, very political. Right. Now I, the next matter show, fact, I had I had tea with her in Athens some years later. Oh, really? Yes, nicely. Oh, good. Oh, good, good. Now the next show was not exactly Greek. You play Yissel Fishbein in the education of Hyman Kaplan. Yes. Now, how in the world did a, a show called The Education of Hyman Kaplan come to be directed by the very non-Jewish George Abbott? Exactly. <laughs> That's when I met Abbott. That was the first of about three or four shows I did for Abbott. Yes, he, he used you a lot. <laughs> oh, he, was, he, was a, he was a darling man and uh, very appreciative of whatever I gave him. I act, well, first... You talk about the education of Hyman Kaplan. I had a very small role. I was actually on stage about eight minutes during the entire play. My entrance was the first act finale. Hyman Kaplan was wooing this little girl in, in his English class, but she had been promised in an arranged marriage in the old country. And everybody was waiting for the arrival of her uh, uh, to-be husband, which was me. Hyman Kaplan was Tom Bosley. Tom was never a, you know, and the, the intent was that he was this poor little guy. And all of a sudden, here comes this. I played it like a um, leading man from the Yiddish theater, you know. <laughs> and... Um, and I had one song in the show, it was the first song of the second act. And it is as close to a showstopper as I've ever had. Um, he was a very negative character. You know, his, his uh, to-be wife was now in America learning English, wanting to become, uh, wanting to go to school, wanting to, to be, become something. And he kept saying, oh, don't worry. You know, you 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 know, you won't have to lift a finger. I'll I'll, I'll take care of you. My song was uh, an old-fashioned husband. I'll be an old-fashioned husband. And by the way, uh, according to the script, he had been. The only reason he wasn't there was he was held up in England for some reason. So I figured he learned to speak English in England. So uh, he had a, a combination Yiddish-British accent. Which, when, when Abbott heard it, that was it. That's what got me the part. Anyway, I figured after all of this struggling, this was gonna be my big moment on Broadway. I'm gonna really hit with this showstopper of a number. And it stopped the show in all, all the previews. Opening night, I went out, I did it exactly the same way to very passive applause, little applause. And I walked off stage thinking I had blown it. What did I do wrong? What happened? Well, I, I was demolished. It was at the Alvin Theater. The dressing rooms were upstairs. Got into the elevator and the elevator man said to me, did you hear what happened? I said, what happened? Martin Luther King was assassinated. There were riots in Harlem. They had a, during the intermission, they came in and got Mayor Lindsay out to go up to Harlem. And I had the first number after the intermission. So the audience already knew, you mean, the word. Oh, yes, out. they were, that's all they were talking about. And you could hear blah, 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 in the audience. That's all they were talking about. They weren't paying any attention to me. My big career moment <laughs> on the tubes. It wasn't actually because a lot of people saw that performance and it led to a lot of shows eventually actually to uh, the Rothschilds. Now before the Rothschilds, there's another Abbott show, which I also saw <laughs> and loved, Three Men on a Horse. Three Men on a Horse. And, and your, one of your co-stars was the adorable Butterfly McQueen. Yes. 
George Abbott liked her a lot. Actually, <laughs> another story about that show, uh, Sam Levine did it. Sam Levine was the original in 1930-something. Sam Levine had played it a thousand times in summer stock, and this was a kind of a revival to bring Sam Lip back. Abbott called me and said, Sam is insisting that so-and-so play his girlfriend and the, I guess his, his present girlfriend to play the part. You want to you wanna do it? Because I don't want her to do it. So I came down to get the script to read it. And by the time I got there, Sam had agreed that the girlfriend would be the understudy and that uh, Dorothy, what's her name was going to play Dorothy the part. Loudon. Dorothy Loudon played the part, which that's who uh, Abbott wanted. So he, he gave me the script and said, see if there's anything you want to play. <laughs> like, how, how would you like that from, from George Abbott? That, that's literally what he said to me. See what you want, want to play. And there was the, the neighbor and there was the... And I, I, I decided if I got this opportunity, I'm really going to go crazy. And I said, how about the third man on a horse who should have been played by Maxie Rosenblum or, you know, who's this big dumb guy, you know. But it was like, if I'm going to do it, well, let's do it, you know. And Abbott said, sure. <laughs> That's why I was there. It was a terrific production that absolutely had the Abbott touch. We, and, and a, don't forget, good, don't forget, things moving. don't forget, well, let me, before you say that, don't forget Jack Guilford. Of course. Jack was in it, and Jack was what gave it the heart. He was terrific. Um, and before you say, keep it moving, let me tell you, I think that's a, well, it, it's true, but that's not all. Abbott's favorite, well, not favorite, but very often he would say to an actor, it's too actory. That was his word. It's too actory. What he meant was, I don't believe it. He was really, what his forte was clarity. Yes. He, clarity, not necessarily speed, but clarity that you that everything made sense and that it was there were no you you didn't have to stop to think about anything it was pure clean when it was presented i guess that represents step on your cue you know which which he has become known known as it's time uh, i remember um, oh god here we go names again <laughs> when the director of uh, of uh, clear day Robert Lewis. Robert Lewis said, uh, after th three weeks of dissecting the characters and what their motivations was, he said, okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's George Abbott time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but that's an interesting point because Robert Lewis was method trained. He's from the group that's theater, the trained. actor studio. I knew Mr. Abbott near the end of his long life. He had no patience for the method and he didn't want to talk about motivation and psychology. He, but he didn't like, uh, no, he didn't have patience for, 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 for what, what's my motivation. He was, you figure it out, but he did clarity and reality and truth. Yes. That's what he wanted. Clarity and truth. In the process, step on your cue. Yes. But, but, it, but that's not what, what really drove him. What drove him was the clarity of the scene. If there was any confusion, that had to go. Now we come to uh, the Rothschilds. I've been listening to the album. It, I think it's a great score. We sing four songs at least that are among, I think, the, surely among the greatest performances in broad, the Broadway musical in my own lifetime. I mean, that's amazing. That's in my amazing. own lifetime was written in Detroit. He tossed a coin, one room, sons, tossed great a coin, material. Tossed a coin was added in Philadelphia. <laughs> what material? And you were just the right one to do it. 
And who I, recognized that you were just right for that part? Okay, I knew Sheldon Harnick. Uh, I met Sheldon when he was uh, wooing his bride, his wife of, who he's still married to, uh, Margie Gray. Margie Gray was in uh, Anything Goes off Broadway with me. And Sheldon was wooing her. He would come down. He, he, he saw the second act of, of Anything Goes by about 150 times. <laughs> and that's where I got to know, she know Sheldon. He, uh, he became a fan and a, a friend. Uh, I auditioned for Fiddler. I auditioned for everything he did. I auditioned for, uh, at least I was there um, and ended up in uh, Apple Tree as a replacement for Larry Blyden. I'm pretty sure at Sheldon's request. Uh, Sheldon also took the, the director of the Rothschilds to see uh, Hyman Kaplan. So Sheldon was a, was a, a fan uh, and a friend and uh, talked to me about that show about two, three years before it was ever done about my doing it. Um, the fascinating thing about the Rothschilds was, unfortunately, it was never a hit. <laughs> it was uh, people, it, it had in, indeed one of the greatest scores, note for note, that I've ever been involved with. It had a major writing flaw or construction flaw. Uh, it was a, a brilliant, actually, uh, basically, it was. How does an oppressed people deal with the establishment? How does the first generation deal with it? And then how does the second generation deal with it? And then you saw my five sons deal with the establishment in the second act. Well, that's a great literary concept, but it turned out to be a very bad dramatic concept because you were basically asking an audience to cash in their emotional chips at the end of the first act and start all over again with new people in the second act. And uh, it, it was obviously a problem the minute we opened in, in uh, Detroit. So they extended my life and uh, actually extended it. I attend uh, a big meeting uh, in the second act which actually historically occurred about four years after my death. Um, but they were trying to keep the, the, the thread going. Uh, I always said that if, I, if, um, if we added one more out of town stop, I would have made it to the final curtain, <laughs> but it didn't quite happen. And it, it was unfortunate because each act separately was brilliant. Was, was my in my own lifetime written? In my own lifetime was written. Second act to strengthen the written, second it, act. It was written specifically to give me a number in the second act, because uh, the uh, you know eventually I die and there's a funeral scene. Uh, well, they kept pushing that further because the minute I died after, uh, I remember the death. A couple of days before we went to Detroit, I went to, to say goodbye to my agent and she said, how's it going? And I said, if I do my job, it won't work. And that's exactly what happened. I had the first act and the audience was with me right to the end of the first act. It was terrific, but by the second act, I'm now an old man and about and die, and then you're supposed to care about what happens after it. It just, that's not a good theatrical uh, concept. And I suspect in the long run, that's what really cost the show because piece by piece, it was brilliant. It just had this kind of book thaw flaw. Do, do, I, do I dare mention the name of Derek Goldby? Well, you know, that, that, the, 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 the fate of Derek Goldby, Derek Goldby was the director that uh, Sheldon brought to see Hyman Kaplan. So I, <laughs> I, I've got nothing bad. I, I was not involved in it. What, 
the problem, the minute we hit the stage, the problem was evident that there was, you know, what are we going to do in the second act to keep the audience with us? Um, I don't know if they ever could have done it, except to rewrite the whole play as an elongated version of the first act or, or somehow, I don't know. They tried all kinds of things, including uh, bringing in Joe Stein. They thought maybe they could soften it and make it more humorous. Uh, I believe that was the reason that uh, Harnick and Bach never worked together again. That was their last show. Yes, that was their last show. And and, and it was over the Derek Golby firing and the bringing in of... Uh, of uh, Joe Stein and uh, Michael Kidd took over. Did, did Michael Kidd give this show a musical theater patina that it needed? That wasn't the problem. That wasn't the problem. I, 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 not in my head. Okay. okay. It was brilliant from the start. It just had this flaw, this theatrical flaw that was generic to it. And, and all the work was spent on the second act, basically, although they did put in uh, coins and uh, tossed a coin. In oh, yeah, fabulous. But they could not solve. They just kept making me older, hoping that the audience would hang in there, you know. Uh, but it wasn't my story in the second act. It was the boys' it story. Wasn't, it wasn't that Derek Goldby didn't have a musical theater craftsmanship? Uh, I don't know what musical theater craftsmanship is anymore. <laughs> uh, I don't think it was that at all. I don't, you know, who knows? Yeah. Now, I, I, the, do you still sing? Are you still singing? I'm still singing uh, ostensibly. Uh, I haven't sung in public since this, uh, well, actually the last play I did was not a musical. I haven't sung until about a, last November I did a musical. So, so you're, you're still singing? I'm still, and, yeah. Still and, when you, and you had a wonderful cabaret show. When you do sing, I hope you do sing your songs from the Rothschilds. I'd, oh yeah, well that's the, the I when I, I I never did a uh, concert act until the Rothschilds when I had a, a lot of requests to appear in places. I put together a, a show was it was half the score of the Rothschilds in the first in his first. Uh, you had you had just first, the right you had just the right voice for it, and what your voice has, and it comes clear in the cast album, your voice has a laugh in it. Thank you. And there's a there's a laugh, and that laugh is so winning, and that's I can see why the audience wanted to spend more time with you. It's in that. Well, laugh excuse in me, voice. excuse me. I'm not I, I'm not I'm not claiming that I made the first act. Believe me, I had the material, I had the character, I had that was well. It was just a brilliantly written first act that worked the way it should work. The problem was there was no second act for the character. And after, as I say, an audience invests in a character um, and they had no place to go in the second act. I don't now, think- After this show, Hal, you, you were in, you had the title, you played the title character in a show that's very famous and very important historically, but it ran for less than a minute. The Sign in Sidney Brustein's Window by Lorraine Hansberry. The People musical. who know theater history know that show. You played Sidney Brustein, and the show didn't work and didn't last. Why? It was a, first of all, it was, a, it was not a revival of, of the play. It was a musical version. So that's already another question. It, it had... Um, it had uh, uh, three or four people as a kind of a Greek chorus in it. They had to make it a, a musical. And it wasn't quite, first of all, it, it was a very inexpensive production, which didn't have the opportunity to go out of town. We did some uh, 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 pre previews on Broadway and then opened cold. And uh, that was one of the problems. They 
couldn't really, they didn't have the time to, to, to work on it. But um, again, I can't tell you why it didn't work. <laughs> you know? But the original I, play, the original before, play didn't work either. But the I have play was not a hit. I say it again. The original play was not a hit either. No, I don't think it was a big hit. I don't think it was a big hit. It was, you know, well enough to run for a while, but the yeah. musical only lasted about a month. Um, but then again, in answer to, I got to tell you, I'll take all the kudos for Barney Miller and the Rothschilds and bells are ringing. But when you come up with my work in Sidney Brewstein's window, I really appreciate that somebody saw it. Because the fact of the matter is, you put just as much into the losers as you do the winners. I've had my I, a, a career of losers, but I've made a but I made a career out of it because you put the same attention, the same work, the same sweat, the same love into every character you play. Do and you know when this you're appears working, if you disappear you know, in two say it again. I say, do you know when you're working on a show and you get very close to it, that this one's going to work, this one maybe is not going to work? No, I, I always think everyone's not going to work because I, 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 I see the seams. The minute I see the seams in a, in a play or a movie, it's gone. So uh, I see the, the seams and the, the problems. And I remember sitting in, in, in Philly a hundred times for my own purposes. I would sit and say, let me see if, if this happened, maybe this would, and I would sit in my hotel room and rewrite a scene that because I thought it would work better that way. Of course, nobody asked me to, and I, <laughs> it was only for my own uh, for my own work. But most of the time, you see the problems in a show. As a matter of fact, I've seen shows shows fixed to death, where when we started, it was it had validity, and then they fixed it and broke it. <laughs> so I don't think, you know, even Mr. Abbott, you know, we had bombs, Mr. Abbott, and nobody, nobody has a, a, a owns the theater, I'm yeah. telling you. Okay, <laughs> I, want to, I, I want to get to Barney Miller, but just a few of your non-Broadway credits, which are fascinating. You toured for quite a while in Manifel Mancha. Yeah. But you played in No No Nanette, opposite Nanette Fabre. No. You didn't? No. No No, no Nanette was, was, our, was across the street from us. You no. didn't do a, You didn't do a regional theater production of No No, no Nanette? Nanette? Hang on a second. <laughs> yes, I think you did with Nanette Fabre. Um, I... I'm old. I don't okay. remember. Okay. I'll tell you the truth. I see things on television today, you know, or on uh, YouTube. Things I, I did that I have absolutely no recollection doing. So uh, you'll have to, I, I, I plead age. Okay. But now you do remember doing Kismet with Dolores Gray for Kismet. the John Kenley players in Ohio. Now John Dolores Gray was playing the part that she had played in the movie in 1955. Your show was 1977. How was that? How was it working with Dolores Gray in that material? She was fine. It was Kenley that was the problem. Oh. <laughs> Kenley was a was known as the great showman of the Midwest. You know, he had these theaters in uh, Ohio and Michigan, and he uh, he had the, it was the top of the summer summer circuit. Uh, money wise, every wise, production wise, star wise, he had he, he had star, always stars, cast. always stars. Oh, he got had the, the women, stars. Cal. He had a production of the women with Gloria Swanson, Mamie Van Doren, Marge Champion, Margaret O'Brien, the most famous summer stock production in history, and only John Kelly, whom I knew, could have brought it together. He couldn't, right? But uh, but I I always questioned his taste. Kismet, 
Kismet was done. I, they did the best they could, you know, for some of stock, uh, putting it together. I, I had enough trouble, you know, doing my own part, so I didn't have a piece of it. But I remember the choreography was an homage to Herb Ross, who had done the original. So it was totally as authentic as possible. As soon as we got up on stage, I got to say this, John Kenley knew his audience. So he had a rehearsal and he had the girls doing high kicks and back, uh, you know, all the, uh, all the authenticity went out the window because his audience really wanted to see chorus girls. Yes. <laughs> it was a, John was a little bit of a, well, if you know him personally, you know John Kelly. I, I knew, I knew John. He was a, he was a very interesting man. <laughs> very, <laughs> interesting. very interesting. Very uh, interesting. And then, uh, am I correct? Your most recent musical theater credit? Did you do uh, something of a tour of Scottsboro Boys as the interlocutor? Uh, yes. In um, yes, I played uh, San Francisco. I, I right. There was a small tour on the West Coast. I played the interlocutor in that. That's not my most recent. No, but. I did. Well, but what did you think of the material there? There are those who think that is the greatest musical of the 21st century. Uh, I know John Kander. John Kander was conductor in summer stock when I was in summer stock. So that's how far back we go. Uh, and John is brilliant. Look at his career. Look what he's written, you know. Um, was this too political? If you remember correctly, they were picketing in New York on Scottsboro Boys. And uh, it was, I believe the black community that was picketing because the show was, was a, a uh, minstrel show. So it was uh, quite controversial all the way through. Um, a couple of the controversial numbers were cut, I believe from the time, by the time I got to it. Uh, but um, Susan Stroman was the uh, director of the, uh, show, the production that I did. It's a good production. Did you like the material? Was it engaging as a performer? I didn't have that much material. As the, I only had one song or, or, or two. I think one, one had been cut before I got to it. Uh, I didn't have that much material. Uh, and I never saw it from out front. So I, I mean, the concept of the, of the staging was fantastic. Everything was built on stage with, with chairs and, and, and ladders. That was it. Every scene the, was constructed right, on, right in front of your eyes. It was Susan Stroman at her best. Um, the actual material of the show, um, again, it was controversial because you had to have an, you had to be able to see the um, the irony in it, shall we say, that everything had to be seen backwards, if you will. You had to see a, a, a man doing blackface and understand that, that you were supposed to understand that it, it wasn't just a minstrel show, it was a comment on a minstrel show, yeah. let me put it that way. And that got a little deep, I think, for some audiences. Yeah. Okay, we can go on and on and on. I would love to, but we have questions from the house, but we have to just segue to, to Barney Miller. Why was that show so successful? It obviously hit a nerve. It obviously had an audience. Right, it, writing. Seven or eight years. Writing. We still talk about the film, about the series with great fondness. What writing. did it have? Writing, writing, writing. Uh, it was it was created by a uh, compulsive man who would not let a word on that get on that screen that wasn't exactly right. Uh, it was a perfectionist to the nth degree, and um, it was uh, it, it was an independent production. Consequently, we would go until four o'clock in the morning shooting it because he wouldn't let it go until it was a, as good as it could be. 
you can't do that with the studio. Studio wouldn't let that. Um, did, did you did did you get tired of your part, or did you find enough no. to keep to be, keep interested for seven or eight years? Because he's a straight guy in a way, isn't he? He's a straight man. Well, yes. you know. So I was the excuse me, I was the audience for all of that humor. Yeah. <laughs> what what better god job can you have? Uh, I was a straight man for eight years, yes. I don't think I had a joke in eight years. <laughs> and that didn't bother you? Not at all, why? Not at all. Uh, again, you always, you start from zero. Start from scratch and you do the same work, whether it's gonna be a success or not, funny, sad, it's all the same technique and you do it as well as you can do it. Did you supply, as a trained actor, did you supply an inner life for the character? Did you give him some sure. little eccentricities for yourself to, to make the character more varied? We, we found a lot of eccentricities along the way. Um, a little vanity. He was vain about wearing his reading glasses. Uh, a problem marriage. We had, it had to be a problem marriage because there were no, <laughs> the wife had to disappear. Uh, all kinds of things. Yes, when well, you do the same work, as I say, no matter how much of a straight man he was, he still was a human being in a situation. Uh, I'm not a very good executive at anything. I, I can't, I, I've never done anything with more than myself. Uh, maybe a conductor or a piano player, <laughs> but uh, to play, you know, a captain in a police force with a function that was outside my realm. I, um, I had done, I had actually gone out with New York police uh, several times in order to play a policeman. So to try and get the experience in the the, the understanding of being under pressure, being under in danger. Um, again, every part you start from zero and you invest everything that's necessary, everything you just keep investing in. What do you think of the use of a laugh track? That's, a, uh, that's an interesting thing. Um, we could use a laugh track because it was an indoor scene and the, and, and we actually started, well, first of all, every sitcom uses a laugh track. You have to, because it's an edited version of three or four different uh, performances, two for an audience, pickups, and you have to edit it together. And the only way you can edit it together is a, is a, a proper laugh track so that there are no cut marks. Uh, we started with a live audience, uh, but it was Danny, Danny Arnold was the creator and it was his perfectionism. So that about the fifth week or so, we didn't have the last scene of the show by the time the audience came in. So he had to cancel the audience, which was something you'd never do in those people come from Nebraska to see something, you know. So the next week, the audience people said, we're not gonna put anybody in there until you tell us it's, it's okay. And we never had an audience again. It turned out to be a godsend, but because it's a cut and paste operation, you have to have a, a soundtrack that is, is continuous. So they use the laugh track. There's also the fact that people like to laugh in community. You sit home and watch a funny movie, you might giggle or you might smile, but you don't really laugh out loud unless you got a whole bunch of people around you. I guess it gives you the right to, to laugh out loud. I don't know, but that's- When, um, when you delivered the lines, there was no laugh track. You played to silence. No, that was, that was the whole point about Barney. That's why I said it was a godsend when we left the audience out. Because 
it turns out that Barney didn't need an audience. Barney needed concentration of actors. Uh, some sitcoms need the vib vibration of an audience. I remember doing a, a show with B. Arthur, uh, and you know she said she couldn't do it without an audience. She needed the timing, uh, which you know I I didn't. I guess that's true on a stage. You do it with a live audience, and you time yourself according to the audience reaction. But generally, when you do a picture, you you don't have an audience. You just go for the for the reality of the situation, uh, and let the laughs come where they where, where they do come. You know, it's a funny situation. You just play it for real. I think that's one of the aspects of Barney that made it so last so long. Is there such a thing as a TV style of acting as opposed to musical theater acting? Is it a different genre? Is it a different species? The technique is exactly the same. The technique is exactly the same. The difference is the size of the proscenium arch. When you're on a stage on a musical with 60 feet of proscenium arch, the size of your choices is different when you're in a 99 seat house and somebody's sitting six feet from you. The proscenium arch is smaller, you have to make it more internal. When you get to a camera and your proscenium arch is only that big, you better be totally internal. Otherwise you're gonna break outside. It's just too much. So that's why you, when you're shooting something, you always ask the cameraman, what's the size? And they'll tell you it goes down to your chest or it's extreme close up, or what they call a Bogart haircut where they get even under your hairline. Um, and you adapt your choices. The technique is exactly the same, but the choices are more either more eternal or more external, depending on how big the picture is. But sometimes in, in TV acting, it seems to me there's an exaggeration and it becomes very stylized. That wasn't true for the Barney Miller ensemble. It, exactly. It depends on the on the quality of the of the of the writing. There were shows, very successful shows. Uh, where and I did them. I did the Drew Carey show. It was, it was bigger. That's all. It was just a bigger show, uh, and and we, we ended up doing a musical number in the middle of a sitcom. You know, but that was the nature of the show. It depends on the nature of the show. Barney was meant to be internal. Play it for real and let the laughs come where they may. They were written into the script. They were by definition funny. You knew that. But the realer you played it, the funnier it really was. You, 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 at the, the acting ensemble didn't punch the lines. No. You, you let the humor emerge. You didn't play it. This is funny. There were very few punch lines. There, other shows have straight line punch line. Yes. And, yes. and uh, that's why I said it was a, it was a godsend when we lost the, audi lost the audience. Because the, the nature, of, for instance, of a, 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 a week, weekly actor, just somebody who comes in to play that one show, he knows where the jokes are. He knows where the laughs are. And if he doesn't get it, or it gets only half a laugh from the audience, the writers say, blew my line, you know, the writers are down on him. So there, there is a tendency to overplay to make sure you get the laugh of the 200 people from Iowa who are sitting in the audience. Barney was not that concept. Barney was smaller. Everybody had to play it this way. You had to play it more internally. And we were lucky once the audience was gone, then it was only a question of playing a scene with another actor. And, and they were great actors, so they were willing to play it for real. It was a it was a godsend to me most. Of it was sort of like a repertory company in a way. It was definitely an ensemble. And not one of that 
ensemble, probably one of the best ensembles, you know, there have been great ensembles, Friends, Cheers, not one of that ensemble ever won an Emmy. You were nominated, what, seven times? Didn't I didn't win. win. I didn't win it for that. I won it for three other things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, 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 we can go on and on, but I can't yes. be selfish. So we're going to open it to the house. But Mark, when we open it to the house, I just want to uh, introduce a friend of mine, who, uh, Walter Wilson, who was nominated for a Tony for Two by Two, the same year that Hal was nominated for the Rothschilds and yes. won. And they are friends with each other, but Walter's in the audience. Walter, if you could unmute yourself and ask the first question or the first comment, and then Mark, after Walter, we can open it to the house from there. Walter, are you there? I don't see Walter. Oh. Okay, Mark, well, maybe Walter was with us. I saw him before. <laughs> there, I there I am. Can you hear me now? Okay, there's Walter. Yeah. Hi, Hal. That was a terrific interview. You were just fantastic. I learned so much. I was just <laughs> great. Listen, you, you, wasn't there a story about how your audition number was uh, rhymes from Kismet, and that's how um, that's how he tossed a coin came to be? Didn't it inspire them to write that? I remember you telling me something about that years and years and years ago. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> rhymes, <laughs> was my, rhymes was my audition number. You know, every time I had a audition, I did, I did rhymes. Um, I don't know. Well, that, I, you'd have I to ask, do, you'd have to ask Sheldon that. I don't know what is. Maybe Sheldon told me that. It might be Sheldon. Maybe Sheldon told you that. Told you that. It could have been. Also, also, I watched a great episode last night. Jody Mann is actually on here. Remember the episode about the guy who robbed the, who was upset with a sperm bank and got arrested? Because he because uh, because they blew his sperm or something, and uh, she was the wife that cried through the whole show. Oh, she that's right. No, no. Get... Right, there was supposed to be. Uh, we're gonna right. I something like it was hysterical. I watched episodes. It. Help, help. Yeah, I watched it last night, and it, you know what's incredible about it? you're right. Well, I I was. It's funny you talked about the laugh track because I kept thinking they don't need a laugh track. It's really well acted. It's so beautifully acted and so honest, as opposed to these schlocky sitcom acting today we get. It is. I wouldn't call it schlocky acting today. You're standing well, in front of an top. audience, and you're playing to an audience. Unfortunately, once you have that uh, that uh, obligation to to communicate with those two hundred people sitting out there. You're beyond the size, as I said before. You're beyond the size of the of the uh, proscenium march. The shot you're shooting in may be up there from here to here, and you're playing like it's a, a sixty foot uh, proscenium march. Um, it's it, the, it's very difficult to to, it to difficult. both to do to to honor both the camera and the audience. We, as I said, were lucky. We lost the audience well, by chance, but because of that, we were able to just play to the, you know, the shot. Well, you certainly did it because I, I, I just it was so honest. I, mean, I, I love that. I love that series so much. I watched the reruns. I mean, it was just it's just great. Al. It's good to see you. You're looking fantastic. Thank you. You're looking you fantastic. Much. Stay well and stay happy. Keep singing in California. I'm doing oh. well. It's hard. You know, I'm singing in my own house. Yeah, <laughs> you and me both like our Zoom musicals, right? Yeah. What did you? What was the musical you just did? I did a musical version of Grumpy Old Men. Ah. Oh. Uh, it, it won't come to Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> but it was. It was a very, I got to play. Of course, the uh, I didn't play the Grumpy Old Man. I played the Dirty Old Man. <laughs> the, 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 uh, his father. Ah. Oh, Interesting. Great. Yeah. It was. It was fun. Oh, great. Well, hopefully we get back to work on stage soon. You know, at least you have a beautiful home and house and great grass to go outside and look at trees. So you're not stuck in the city, which is a plus. I'm, I overlook the water. I'm on the oh, show. Oh, beautiful. I'm Marina Del Rey. Beautiful. Yes. Beautiful. Well, stay well, stay happy. And thanks for letting me talk to him, Foster.
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Walter. Walter Willis. Thank you. Mark, do we have some questions from the house? We do. Thank you, Walter. Always good to hear from you. Uh, the next question is from Jim Brochu. Why don't you unmute yourself? You're not unmuted, Jim. I can... There, hello? There you go, now you go. Hello, Hal. Hello, Jim. How are you? Tell me where we work together. I produced It's Only a Play. Oh, yes. And oh. Uh, we worked together with Sheldon at uh, when, when he was getting a, uh, he was getting some kind of a lifetime achievement and I did Rich Man and you did uh, in my own lifetime. Okay. It was a great, great night. Uh, my first question is personal. How's Nora? <laughs> Bless you. Um, and I, I spend more time with my kids now than I, than I normally <laughs> do because we Zoom every Sunday. <clears throat> so Nora's now, uh, she's working. Um, they're all good. They're all good, as good as they can be in a pandemic. Let me put I'm it I'm very way. happy to hear that. Please send her my love I when will, you talk to her. I will I do that. Absolutely adore her. All right, here's my question. I've always heard a story, and I want to know if it's apocryphal or not. When you were doing the pajama game, the revival with Barbara McNair mm -hmm. and Eddie, uh, no, not Eddie Foy, Cap but uh, Cap that's Cap right, uh, Cab Calloway. There's a story that you were trying to get something across to George Abbott about your hesitancy and that Abbott had a response to you. Do you know what I'm talking about? All right, let me, let me tell you the whole story and tell me if it's true or not. That he stopped you and he said, how would you speed this up? And you said, Mr. Abbott, I'm trying to get a quality of holding back, of not knowing what to say, of being shy. And he was supposed to have said, how I'm getting a quality of slow. <laughs> uh, uh, apocryphal. apocryphal. Well, it's a good story anyway. It's a good story. Most, <laughs> most of the apocryphal ones are the good stories. The ones it's that nice, to, nice to see you, Hal. <laughs> good to see you. I will speak to, I'll say hello to Nora. All right, our next question, Beth Goff, would you unmute yourself? Bottom right, isn't it? Bottom left. Bottom left, unmute. No, I can't hear you. Do you know sign language? <laughs> All right. Well, Beth is doing that. We'll go to the next and we'll come Why back. Why are you working you. on it, Beth? We'll go to the next one. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go to the next one. We'll come back to you, Beth. Um, Margo Astrakhan, you have your hand up. Why don't you unmute yourself if you can? Where am I looking at Margo? Thank you. Oh, well, yeah. a long time ago, I think, how we had dinner with Leonid Spitzer. I wasn't blonde, you weren't gray. It was, <laughs> you, were going, you were going to California to, uh, because Barney Miller was a big hit and you were making the move. And they, and they were missing you already but before you left. And we played a lot of piano when you sang. You don't need to remember, I do. I remember Leonid. Yeah. I remember that. They adored you, they were bereft when you moved. Uh, I was kind of bereft too. <laughs> <laughs> but you kept it in New York. I actually, I actually pleaded with Danny Arnold. I said, "This, this show is shot is about New York cops. Why are we doing it in California? Why don't we do it in New York? Got all those great New York actors you can use." And he just said, "I hate New York. I don't want to be there." And that was it. <laughs> are you? That's why. Uh... <laughs> He didn't like New York. He's from New York. He was from New York. That's like this, his experiences were all that great uh, as a young man. But and, you were right. Well, we did, we did we did it in California, and listen, I never came back to New York. What can I tell you? I'm still out here. Yeah. 
Nice to see you. A pleasure. Nice to see you. All right. Well, Beth Gott has uh, gotten through her technical problems. Beth, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? No. Yes. Oh, yeah. good. Great. Okay. So, Mr. Linden, it's so nice to get a chance to talk to you. Uh, you had a fun appearance on the Gilmore Girls uh, in which you were you know, the distinguished older man who got to dance with Emily Gilmore in the 60-40 bar. Um, two questions. Uh, was that a, sort of a special appearance in any way? And did you ever get to um, dance or actually work with Kelly Bishop in any other productions? Uh, first answer, no, I never did work with Kelly again. Um, it was just a, a, a gig. <laughs> I don't want to make it, you know, I didn't know I was going to be dancing when I, when I took the job. Okay. We ended up uh, choreographing a, a Lindy up, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was a slow dance, but yeah, it was, well, it was very cool anyway. So it was like, oh, look, it's Hal, Hal Linden. <laughs> there you go. So, thank you. A pleasure. <laughs> Uh, Hal, we have a question from uh, Elliot Rappaport who asked, what was it like working with Hilly Elkins on the Rothschilds? Hilly, Hilly had a house on East 70, something, 60 something, 70, right off Fifth Avenue. He had a brownstone. I tell you this because Hilly was totally self-aware. Hilly was about five foot eight, five foot seven, something like that. And when you walked into Hilly's house, the picture over the fireplace was Napoleon. <laughs> Hilly was, um, oh God, what's the name of the character? <sighs> I'm, I'm blanking again. H Hilly was, was something else. Um, today you would call him a con man maybe he just got everything accomplished managed it with without funds he got it done Hilly was an accomplisher um, and, and his name was Hillard not Hilliard I called him Hilliard once it was Hillard um, who's the character I'm thinking about? All right, forget it. Uh, blanking, go ahead. Next. <laughs> Michael Colby, I'm sure you've got a good, great question. Well, I hadn't, but I always am eager. I mean, I used to wear out the uh, off-Broadway recording of Anything Goes. Uh, I think wow. it's my favorite recording of that between you and Eileen Rogers and it was, what was that experience like? I took a cut and pay from unemployment insurance to do that. Um, it was, <laughs> that was the first of the kind of re revivals and that probably the most successful in, in its time. Um, now that was a George Abbott play from the 30s that was restructured, totally restructured for the offered Broadway version and basically rewritten in order to be restructured. Um, God, I'm the yeah, they had a lot of interpolations. Every, uh, what's his name? The guy who played Moonface. Um, Mickey Deems. Mickey Deems used to come in every day. He said, I got a joke. You say this, I say that. And we put it in. Every day he had another joke that came in there. The whole play was restructured. The original starts, the, you know what the opening number in the original is? I get a kick out of you. Yeah. Done in a bar, done in one by Reno about me. And then the never, that's the end of the relationship. So it made no sense. It was a, it was re put in a different place in our version or the version of the, of the director. And um, opening night, the original writers, again, blank. Uh, Bolton and... Um... Bolton, right. Guy Bolton and 
Right. Uh, well, opening well, night, they came to the party. They saw the show and they came to the party. And you know what Guy Bolton said? Still works. <laughs> Barbara Lang was in that too, wasn't she? Barbara Lang was my vis-a-vis, -vis, yes. Yes. So was, uh, oh God, don't ask names. Marjorie Name. Gray, you mentioned. Yeah. She did that. It was, it was, it was Happy Hands at Home off Broadway. And uh, the, the one thing I remember is opening night, my pants tore. <laughs> and the, the, the choreographer took off his pants and gave it to me to wear on stage for some, you know, we were the same size. That's, that's my big memory. <laughs> Other than the than than spending all that time with Margie and 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 Sheldon, uh, it was a well, it was a great experience. Yeah. A, fr a friend of mine, Stephen Cole, wrote uh, Dodsworth that you did a regional production of. That's right, Dodsworth played that too. Uh, unfortunately, that never made it. Eh. I'll tell you a story about Dodsworth. <laughs> You say you were going to ask a question that had never been asked of me. Uh, I, I don't think you have yet. <laughs> <laughs> but one guy did. I was doing, a, I remember it was like a five o'clock news hour interview somewhere, sometime. I have no idea where. But all of a sudden he said to me, is there something you can do that no one knows about? Now that's a question that was never asked of me. And my answer was yes. I spent my life before the theater as a professional musician. Yeah. I can tie a bow tie without a mirror. <laughs> Don't ask me why. I mean, it was because I could never have tie a bow tie and a, uh, uh, one band leader showed me how he does it. And that's the way I've been doing it ever since. We're doing um, that show in Texas. Uh, what show is it? Dodgeworth. 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 And there's a scene in Dodgeworth in that version in a, uh, a, a we're going to Europe on an ocean liner and it's in, in our room and we're getting dressed to go to the captain's table for the big dinner. Me and my wife, who's in the off stage, getting dressed. And I start out in my shorts and guarded socks. And, and during the scene, as I'm talking to my wife off stage, I'm getting dressed until I finally put on everything. We're in uh, uh, white tie and tails. No, white, white, white. black tie, There's a tuxedo to go to the captain's table. And I, as we're staging it, I said to the director uh, to tie the tie, where's the mirror? Where are we you're gonna have a mirror? He said, on the downstage wall. Now, what does that mean? That means I gotta walk to the front of the, or, of the stage and pretend there's a mirror in front of me as I'm looking right out over the audience and tie a bow tie. No mirror, an imaginary mirror. And I said to the director, you've probably hired the only actor in actor's equity who can tie a bow tie without a mirror. And that's what I did every night, tied the bow tie. I think we have time for one more question before we turn Mark, it back to Mark, Foster. Mark, uh, Mark uh, Jody Mann, who has a memory about Barney Miller, is in our audience and would like to make a comment. Sure, go ahead, Jody. Hello? Jody? Sure I am. Hi, Hal. Okay, hello. There's no I'm visual going? of me because I don't look like I did when, when I did Barney Miller. But I just want to say, just as a little reminder and also a story about Danny, which, I, which was what you were saying about him and how brilliant he was. When I did the episode of the bank, of the sperm bank, it was the woman who finds out that her husband's in jail because the sperm bank uh, defrosted his sperm and then he broke up the, the bank and then was arrested. Right. But 
this, but the story, it was written totally different, the script, when I got it. And I mean, I was still thrilled to be on, on the show. But we were doing rehearsals, and Danny from his chair yelled, cut, everybody go back to their dressing rooms. And that was in the middle of my scene. <laughs> so I was sure while I was waiting that I was going to be fired. And then all of a sudden, my, he called my name to the stage. I went there doom and gloom. And all he did was look at me and went, hey, kid, can you cry? And I said, well, yeah, <laughs> especially if you're going to fire me. He said, no, I just thinking about this and I want to redo everything. The line's the same, but you're going to cry throughout the whole thing. <laughs> and I mean, it made that script work. It was just, he just had that kind of mind. And I absolutely loved doing that show. It was like the highlight of my career. Danny Arnold was the closest thing I ever met to a comedic genius. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. You know, he was a, a, a failed stand-up comic. He, he was? I didn't know met. that. He, he was uh, a comic. And uh, that's where he met Jack Sue, playing oh, little yeah. nightclubs. Jack was a singer. Wow. And, and all the many years later, here he was. It, it was wonderful. I mean, you guys made, even at four o'clock in the morning, you guys, it was a wonderful group of people to be with. And, and I don't think, out of anything else that I've done, I don't have the, mo the memory that I do of doing your show. It was absolutely a wonderful group of people. Me too. I don't have. <laughs> I'm telling you, I did a lot of television after that, and I never had the the feeling of uh, of a repertory company, of Absolutely. you know, where everyone was devoted only to the product, no egos, no uh, you know, you do it my way. No, none. And you made every guest feel, because I knew a few friends who were on the show, and every guest felt so welcome and loved every minute. And like I said, even if you worked until four or five in the morning. I'm still in touch with Max Gale, and he, and he, he was wonderful. And he remembers, he remembers the show that, that I did like it was yesterday, which was such an ego boost. So I just loved it. I loved it, and I want to thank you. I've had this opportunity because of Walter telling me about this, and it's an honor to tell you that after all these years. Thank, Thank you, you Al. You do realize that Max Scale and I are the only surviving members. Um, I didn't want to mention that. I do know. Yes. Yeah. As of about a, uh, a month ago. Uh, who, who, who did we lose? I thought, I thought, who was that? Um, uh, you recall? Um, Cause I... No, um, uh, he played Chano. Um, oh. Wait a minute. Chano uh, j just died about a month ago. That, and, and he, uh, Gregory no, Sierra. Gregory Sierra. Oh, okay. And, and he, wasn't it, in, he wasn't in the series when I did it, but yes, okay. I, re I remember. Now it's me and Max is, uh, of the only regulars left. Right. And right. Actually, Mark, my, my final question is, is leads off from that. Uh, Hal, what's remarkable, and people should know, you've never retired. You never stopped working. You've you, you don't work. believe in retirement, which is wonderful. You're still an active actor. But is there anything you haven't done that you would <laughs> like to do? For instance, for instance, I think you, you could have done or still could do classic theater. I'd love to see you in Shakespeare in, in the appropriate part. Yeah. Wouldn't yeah. that have been something you would have wanted on your resume? I would have loved it on my resume. But uh, I'll be honest with you. You have to understand. I first, I, I I never. I made my Broadway debut before I had an acting lesson. Uh, I have, I never went to school as it for to be an actor. I never. I do not have a an act. You know, a degree in theater. I never was trained in 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 classical theater, and I. I've honestly avoided it for that reason <laughs> ever since. I but don't, you could have done it. I bet you could have done the right part in Shakespeare. I, I'm, I would have worked my ass off, I'll tell you that, but I just never pushed for it because I was always, what, of the opinion that I was not trained for it. 
I've worked with people who can ad lib in iambic pentameter. <laughs> uh, it was always a strange world for me. Uh, I, had tr- I had trouble with Kiss Me Kate. <laughs> Seriously. Yes, because you have there's some Shakespeare there. <laughs> yes, and I had difficulty with it. So how was uh, it playing Jack Warner? On wicked <laughs> ways. Talk about miscasting. Jack Warner was about five seven or something, <laughs> well five five I think. Um, that was fun. That was fun. Uh, Jack Warner was a as successful as he was. He always wanted to be a performer. Always wanted to, uh, and no matter who who you are, he would tell you a joke. He was always telling jokes, but so, not successfully. And not, not successfully, you know. No, so, no. how do you play somebody who's a lousy comic? <laughs> anyway, this, uh, I think hasn't this been a wonderful evening? We, I think this is the longest interview we've ever had. It could have gone on and on and on. Thank well, you, Hal well, Linden. Before we cut out, I, singing I, and performing. Before we cut out, I have one other person who's been trying to get in here, so we'll give her the final question or comment. Arlene, would you arm, unmute yourself? Where's Arlene? Where am I looking? Oh, hi. Uh, you, you know, I, I am loving listening to all this stuff, you know, but you are so incredible. You are somebody that, that has, you're an actor, you're a singer, you're a TV star, um, you're a charming gentleman. So I just want to say I met you years ago with Mitch Lee before you were on Broadway. When yes. you were performing, you were singing with a group we went down and uh, downtown um, to hear you. That was the first time I met you. And of course, Mitch Lee, uh, we know, is the composer oh, I, I, of La Mancha. I'm La Mancha. But I worked, and, I worked for Mitch. I worked for Mitch uh, for his uh, um, music production company. Uh, there well, are jingles music. out there that I'm singing through Mitch's company. Excuse me, that's what kept me alive in the 60s. <laughs> okay, but that was where I saw you because you were doing jingles. It was Music Makers. Mitch, yeah. Mitch went down to hear you and I was there. So that was amazing. Yeah. And then uh, later in Atlantic City, I interviewed you on my television show. Wow. Um, I brought my kids. You were great. You were doing something different all the time. And here in Florida, I booked you as talent on a group called Showtime. Um, which was great. You know, again, you do so many different things. And then I had arranged at FAU, if you remember, you received an award. Um, You didn't have to sing, you just needed to talk. We went to dinner afterwards. But, you know, I'm so amazed at your talent. When you say that you don't have any formal training, let me tell you, you do- As an actor, excuse me, as an actor, I had formal training as a musician. I was a very accomplished musician when I slid into the theater, kind of accidentally. <laughs> but look at all you do. I mean, I am in awe and I'm just so glad. I love, love listening to you. I learned so much. Uh, I'd love to interview you again. <laughs> you know you know why I do so many things? Well, first of all, you could describe it as a jack of all trades, right. master of none. <laughs> The point is, in order to get into the theater, you could never say no to a job. I couldn't, I couldn't afford not to do a job. So I had to learn how to do every damn thing I did. And I managed to do it well enough to make a living and raise four kids on the west side of Manhattan when I was trying to bust into the Broadway theater. So. Uh, a lot of it is because I had to. But you do it so well. Thank you so much. Good to see you again, Arlene. Thanks. Same here. Well, on behalf of the Lambs and our guest, Hal, thanks so much for doing this. First of all, let me give Foster a quick thank you. You're always such a great interviewing job. Foster, wave, say yes, hi. Thank you, Foster. <laughs> thank well, you, Hal. Good. You did not come up with a question that had not been asked of me before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> so we, we still got a few more to go. We right. have to continue then. Right. Uh, also, I want to, again, thank uh, my uh, co-producer who makes these great connections, Magda Katz. Would you inter- uh, mention our next program? 
and she is doing sign language as well. Okay. okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Well, first I want to thank Hal. You were fabulous. You made this such a special evening. And of course, Foster and my uh, partner, Mark, uh, the evenings are just so special. And uh, next week, February 9th, we're gonna have the New York Theater Barn. It's a production company that puts on wonderful performances. So I hope uh, people come and uh, join us again. And uh, Hal, can I hold you to that picture? So I will get in touch with you to get that picture of the lambs off your wall. Oh, you know, okay. Okay. Do, do, do remind me. Yes, I will. Okay, thank you and be well. And thank you again, you were fabulous. Bye, so, bye. Thank you. For and on a final note, everyone, this video will be up on our website tomorrow afternoon. Please feel free to share the link. Uh, we posted a few times the lambs.org and the lambs is hyphenated. Look under recent events. Uh, in the emails you received on the event, you can see all kinds of links of what ways you can help the lambs to keep us running. And with that, I will offer once again many thanks to Hal for doing this. And a good evening, everybody. Good night now.